Hello bakers and welcome to Upside Down. Today we are going to be checking how to create a massive open world map inside Unreal Engine 5. A while ago I made a video on the topic of how to create a massive open world map inside Unreal Engine 4 and today we are going to check what are the differences and what are the changes that Epic made to Unreal 5. Without further ado, let's roll the intro. What you see at the moment is uh, just a basic template that uh, I did from Unreal. So I just created a standard project with uh, the third person template inside. And as well, I clicked to have the starter content so that we have some things that we can import. The first thing we are going to do uh, to start our open world map is to go to file and after that new level. And here you are going to see that we have a couple of different options. This is similar to the menu that uh, we had before, where you can start uh, from some of the template maps. But now we have an open world map as well, which by default will have most of the things enabled and there will be just like some small changes that we will need to tweak. So I'm just going to select it and click create. This is how the map should look like once you have everything loaded. And the first thing that we need to check is if our world partitions are enabled. This is the system that Epic have changed from world composition. So before we had the world composition where we had different segments and different uh, parts of the map and we were loading them depending on the settings. And now it's called world partition and it's very similar to how world composition was working, but uh, there are some small differences. So uh, how to check this? Uh, this is something that uh, if you're taking the project from Unreal 4 to 5, you will definitely need to change. But if you generally are creating the project inside Unreal 5, it should be by default turned on. So we go to edit and then to project settings. And here we can type world partition. And word partition, you need to uh, make sure that uh, you have this tick turned on. If not, you need to enable it in order for the next steps to work. Now that uh, this is something which is enabled, we can go to the tab called word partition. If you don't have this tab, you can find it in window and then world partition. And here you have world partition editor and as well data layers outliner. We're going to need both of these because in a second we are going to look what exactly the data layers are doing. Now let's see the world partition. So if I select it, you will be presented with a map with uh, different sections. Each of these sections is a segment on its own. And if we would like to load all the content in there, we can just select all the cells or just one cell, right click, load selected cells or unload all cells or unload only the selected ones. If you're just beginning uh, your project, it will be easy to plot everything since uh, there is not a lot of content. But the moment that you're starting to put more and more data, you might want to unload some of them in order to have better performance. Each of these cells represent the roughly the grid of how exactly your uh, world is going to be splitted and how exactly uh, after that things are going to be loaded. And we can tweak the settings for all of this in terms of how big are the cells and as well when exactly they should be loaded or not loaded. How we're going to do this is going by world settings and then there is a section called world partition. Here we need to have the enabled streaming and uh, in order to see the grid inside the viewport and have a little bit better understanding of uh, where exactly these segments are, uh, there is this uh, section over here called runtime settings, grids, and on the bottom you have preview grids. If we enable it, we are now going to see these white lines which represent where are the cells and how big they are. Then we have on the settings uh, up here, we have the cell size and as well the loading range. So these are two things that uh, we need to tweak in order to get the best performance and to set it up for the project that we are working on. So uh, the cell size uh, by default, you can see that uh, these cells, I would say that uh, they're fairly big. Uh, of course you can 
drop just a character inside and see how, how big they are. But to help you a little bit understand this and to help you a little bit uh, plan it for your project, I would uh, think initially, like when I'm making my level designs, how much content I would like to have in each of the cells. For example, if you're doing a more nature, open world game where you have uh, more trees, mountains and all this kind of stuff, uh, and not that many structures, and then the characters are running around, there are some uh, monsters that are spawning or enemies and everything. Uh, in that case, I would probably keep the cells a little bit bigger, because having smaller cells uh, means that you will be loading more often uh, information in and out from the memory, and having bigger size, this will happen uh, not as often, but uh, having bigger cells means that you will load bigger chunks. So for example, if your game is a game that uh, you are playing in a city, like an open world game in a city, then I would probably uh, prefer to work with smaller cells and let's see for example if I make it something like that it will be kind of half of the size of the previous ones so uh, I would prefer to work with smaller cells when doing so content packed uh, games like for example and areas like cities or uh, if you have like some bigger structures and a lot a lot more elements uh, because this way you will better manage the information that is being loaded and Unreal will better manage uh, what exactly to display on the screen and just will have a, a lot better performance. Then the other thing is about the range uh, loading distance. So in order to uh, tell you how exactly this works, I will just zoom out a little bit like this and get my snipping tool just to make a small drawing. So for example, if we are over here, our character is bound over here, and then we have our field of view like this. This uh, range of uh, how far everything is being loaded uh, is going to load all the cells that are partially visible or visible inside this, this range. And then it will load it all the way to this distance. So for example, if this number is somewhere over here, so this cell is going to be like the last one that uh, it's loaded. And of course, like this one here and this one here, but then everything uh, which goes beyond that point, it will not be loaded. So this is how the distance works. Have in mind that uh, there are some issues that I encountered in some of uh, my uh, projects that I worked on and uh, this is like for example if you have some uh, objects which are with very huge boundary box that go uh, let's say on a couple of cells and this mostly is happening let's say if you have some uh, smaller cell size and then you have some huge structures in your game so if you have something like this uh, the boundary box of this object will be loaded so this means that uh, the cell itself as well will be loaded and so on and so on so uh, have in mind uh, all of this when you're designing your levels and when you're making your uh, gameplay design and how everything will be happening on the level basically so uh, knowing this you need to take into consideration uh, the cell size based on uh, the amount of content and as well the range, how far you would like uh, the players to be able to see and how far you will actually need uh, for the game to load. Now let's talk about the content and adding uh, all the things inside uh, your scene. So uh, if I I'll just grab a box over here in one of the cells and let's scale it a little bit. Let's say that this is uh, a building that uh, I would like to have uh, or some sort of structure I would like to have in my game. And at the moment, this uh, box itself is not in any particular layer. It's something which is just being loaded inside the level. And what do I mean by that? Uh, let's go into data layers and see that like we don't have anything in the list. I mentioned earlier that Unreal, they changed uh, the system from the world composition to world partition and uh, data layers is uh, probably the biggest change and also how assets are being loaded. What do I mean by how assets are being loaded and how information is being stored? Before we had uh, the following system. So if this level, uh, I'm let's say going to save it. So we're just going to save it and I'll name it level 02. So this means that now I have level 02 
And uh, before, how people were working with uh, the world composition was to have uh, a main level, which was the container for all the other sub-levels, and then having like each of the sub-levels with different things. So we can have one sub-level with buildings, one with VFXs, one with uh, vegetation, and uh, all these kind of elements. So uh, this was done because uh, the information in Unreal 4 was stored inside each of the levels. So all the assets, like this asset at the moment, uh, this information was stored inside the level. What does this mean? This means that if I am editing, let's say we uh, work as a team with a couple of other people to develop a game and I have some of the levels that I'm working on. So uh, we use uh, some sort of a source control like Pairforce or something else. And if I have the levels and I'm working on, no one else will be able to work inside that level. So this means that all the data which is put, for example, inside the uh, sub-level buildings will be uh, edited just by me. Unreal 5 uh, and Epic took a completely different approach to this. So at the moment we have the level 02, which I just saved, which is our container. And then each of the assets that we are placing inside is a change on its own. So it doesn't interfere anyhow with uh, me uh, and the need of having other sub-levels. So we all were working in the same level and then each of the assets is an individual entity that is being added to the game. Of course, this uh, again requires a little bit of coordination, uh, especially when you get to zones that uh, both people like the transition zones and uh, you will need to coordinate this with your team and the rest of the people that are working on the project. But overall, it's a much better and nicer system to work with. And I think it's uh, very beneficial for uh, the overall development of bigger projects. So, uh, what does this mean as well for the files and how everything is being submitted? The thing is that before, uh, when we were submitting a file uh, and we have, uh, for example, level with the buildings and then we have a lot of data inside that file, it was a very huge chunk of information that was being submitted every time through the server or uh, is being saved on uh, every time. So now when uh, the information for the assets is stored by itself, uh, then uh, we no longer have those huge submits, but instead we have uh, other very small, uh, but a lot of small submits uh, to our project. So what you will see is that uh, instead of uh, submitting, for example, a file which is uh, 20 or 30 megabytes or even more, uh, instead of doing something like that, you will be actually submitting uh, the same amount of data if you make a lot of changes, like the same amount of size in terms of data, but uh, split it into small chunks. Of course, how many chunks, uh, it depends on how many changes you did uh, to the level. Uh, now let's talk about the data layers. So uh, data layers is uh, a way to kind of organize everything and also one more layer of uh, way how you can optimize and further improve the performance. So as I said, this uh, cube that I did at the moment, which will represent the building that we have, uh, it's uh, going to be a building in the game and it's uh, placed inside uh, the level 02 that we just saved. It doesn't have uh, any group, any layer, any partition. Uh, it's just inside that uh, level and inside uh, this section of our world partition. So uh, what can we do in order to improve the loadings and everything that's happening? Uh, we can create a new data layer. So I'm just going to create a new data layer by right clicking uh, somewhere here into the empty space. And I'll call this building 01. So now we have building 01. If I hide it and unhide it, you will see that nothing is happening. This is because we don't have our asset inside that layer. How to place it there is we need to select it. Then we need to have selected the layer that we would like to place the asset inside. Right click and add selected actor to selected data layer. Now, when we have the asset selected, you will see that uh, this layer is uh, highlighted with blue color, which means that the asset is part of this uh, group over here. And if we hide it and unhide it, we will, uh, of course, hide only this asset uh, from the scene. Now, what we can do is, uh, let's say we want to add more things. Uh, if I would like to copy uh, or duplicate the box, the building that we have uh, by holding Alt and just drag it on the side, you will see that now this building is also inside this data layer. So if I hide it, it automatically uh, already recognizes that it needs to be in the same. 
but uh, if we want to change it, let's say that this is a building two and this is building one and we would like to, to split them, uh, we can do this very easily by creating a new data layer. We call it building zero two. And now we can right click and add selected actor to selected data layer. Now, there is one thing that I would like you to notice. And this is if I hide now this, you will see that nothing is happening. And if I hide this, also you will see that uh, only this one is being hided. This is because if I deselect the layers over here and just select uh, the second building, you will see that both of the data layers are highlighted. This means that this building at the moment exists as information both in uh, building 01 and 02. So we need to remove it from 01 in order for this building to be on its own. This is done by right clicking and then remove selected actor from selected data layer. Now it will be only uh, the building 02 highlighted. And if I hide it, I'm hiding this one and the other one. So this is uh, the way how you add, remove and uh, create new data layers. What else we can do with the data layers is uh, we can create sub levels. So for example, let's say in that building, we starting to add some uh, furniture. So building one, we can uh, create new data layer and uh, I'm going to name this furniture and then I'm going to drag it on top of building one. And you can see that uh, it goes a little bit uh, more to the inside. And this means that uh, the furniture is part of our buildings, but the building is the parent and the furniture is uh, a child structure uh, from this building one. And if we hide this uh, element, it will hide everything which is uh, under this hierarchy, but we can also hide some of the childs from the whole structure. So let's uh, right click and add this uh, chair to the uh, correct layer of furniture and you can see we can hide just the furniture or we can hide both. So why this is great and why this is very important. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, if you're building bigger cities, you will have a lot more assets, and especially if you would like to have uh, interiors for all these buildings. So what you can do in order to further optimize, not only to have this partition, from the world, like not only to have uh, this segment, which you are loading and then let's say everything else that you are unloading, but also if you are outside your buildings, you can load everything, but hide all the furniture assets by creating some blueprints. Or if we go inside, let's say building one, we can just unhide all the furnitures from that building, but hide all the other buildings that are around it. This improves further the optimization for the project. If this is a topic which is interesting for you, leave a comment down below and I'm going to make more videos about the open world topic and as well how you can optimize further your projects. Thank you for joining me in today's tutorial. I hope that this was useful and helpful for you. Subscribe to the channel and see you next time.